Well, thank you all for coming. Welcome to Truth Seekers. Uh, I'm Scott Walton, my brother Jody Bishop and I, we are the disciples of Yahweh in Christ. The purpose of this meeting is to teach Christians apologetics so that you can share the gospel, whether that's in witness or evangelism encounters uh, or missions, whether that's a, a, a brief mission trip or a long-term stay in a country overseas. <clears throat> and uh, we are a new ministry. We do ask for your support. Please, please pray for us and visit our YouTube channel. And we now have a Facebook page. I'll give you the details of that in the description box here in YouTube and at the end, near the end of this video. And now today we have a very uh, special guest speaker. I'm very excited because we're finally going to have some questions answered. Uh, but here to give a serious introduction to our guest is Brother Jody. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, we've got a, a, a very great man of God, a very uh, great legend. I mean, he was actually our first person from India. I mean, he was actually born in India. So that's really cool there. I really love that. He was born from you know, missionary parents in India, and I think his grandparents were missionaries. Uh, he's got a, a program uh, on YouTube. Fander Films. Fander, Fander Films. Films. CF, yeah, not, fat, not, not Pathfinders. I'm not sure who they are. Oh, okay. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but we really appreciate his ministry. He's also a great teacher. He actually came to England to speak on Speaker's Corner. I would love to join him well, there gonna... one day on Speaker's Corner oh, as he goes, goes back. And then he came to America. So we're glad to have Brother Jay. He's a great man of God. So let me introduce you, Brother Jay Smith. Hello, Jody. Nice to be here. Listen, it's, a, it's great uh, to meet you guys, finally to hear and uh, actually participate on your program. Thanks for inviting me. And of course, the the topic we're going to talk about today is not only controversial; it's confrontational, and that's that's what I do. I'm a polemicist, which means I go the opposite direction as an apologist. Though I use both, I do apologetics and polemics. And I understand you would like to also get in and start using polemics. Yes, I want to learn that and uh, learn how to witness to Muslims more effectively. All right. And uh, yeah, just uh, tell us, uh, you said Muhammad didn't exist, so let's have the evidence. <laughs> okay, this is, uh, you've asked me to talk about this subject, and this is the subject that's probably close to my heart. I really started engaging in this question back in 1995, 1994, let's even back up further. In 1994, I was taking a course uh, at University of London at the School of Oriental and African Studies. And I was studying under Dr. Gerald Haunting, uh, just a course that he was teaching on the origins of Islam. At that time, I, I, I had already had a master's degree in Islamics. I had another master's degree in apologetics. So I thought I knew everything I was going to find out about Islam until I took this course. And I'd never, never heard some of the things coming out of Dr. Gerald Haunting's mouth. This is the kind of material you just don't get in America. It's much more of a European study. This is the looking at what we call historical criticism of Islam, Read, introducing redacted criticism, source criticism, these literary criticisms, textual criticism of the Quran. These kind of criticisms we have not yet really touched here in the United States. We're way behind Europe in this area. The problem is the Europeans don't want to talk about it in public. They want to keep it undercover. They want to keep it below the radar. Even as I was uh, taking this class from Dr. Gerald Haunting, I would take what he was saying in class down to Speaker's Corner, which is a world famous, I don't know if you've ever been to London, if you ever are, go there on a Sunday. It only exists on Sunday. But it's the one place on earth where you can say anything you want. It's the bastion of freedom of speech. And I was down there for 25 years, every Sunday, over a thousand Sundays that I was there getting up on a ladder. And I would introduce this new material that he was, that he was teaching in his course. I remember him taking me into his office, and he was furious when he heard what I was doing. Absolutely livid. He says, do not ever use this in public. And that's the problem right there. Jody, that's the problem right there. And Scott, they don't want anybody to hear this. They don't want it to get out, and they don't want their name attached with it because of this fear. There is such a fear of repercussions, such a fear of what Muslims may do to them or what might happen to their career. 
And I remember turning to him and I said, listen, I'm field testing this for you. I'm actually taking it into the public sphere, getting it out where people can hear it and getting their reactions. They're not going to attack you. They're going to attack me and they are attacking me. And I got beat up. I got my glasses broken. You can see where they try to open up my throat here. They, they did not like this material. And I realized at that point that this was really the Achilles heel of Islam right here. This is it. This is what's going to break Islam. And it's fascinating because the questions I was asking were the exact same questions that were asked of Christianity back in the 1800s and in the 1900s. This, you know, did Jesus exist? Did he live in a place called Palestine? Do we know what he said and did? Do we know whether that is true? Can we trust the gospel accounts? Can we trust the New Testament? Can we trust Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Who's Paul? These are the kind of questions that were asked of Christianity. There was a huge furore back in the early 1900s concerning this kind of material. And I was sitting and saying, hold on a minute. We've gone through this as Christians, and we've answered every one of those questions. Those, that's why today we stand on the back of those who've gone ahead of us and responded to this kind of attack against our Bible, against our Lord Jesus Christ, against his historicity, you name it, we've done it. And that's why we're taking the same questions and asking them of Islam. What kind of questions? Well, let's start and let's take a look. Here's the first question. And this is the one that I, I remember taking back in 1994, 1995. So we're talking about 26, 27 years ago that I first started asking these questions in public to Muslims. And they were dumbfounded. They had no response. The first question, what do you know about your prophet Muhammad? Now, let me ask you, Jody and Scott, tell me, what do you know about Muhammad? Just tell me. You probably don't know an awful lot, but just tell me what you think you know. Oh, I don't know a lot. I know what the Muslims claim that he was born, you know, uh, born, but I don't see no. Hey, okay, born in 570, died in 570, died in 632. What else do you know? Where did he, he live? He lived in Mecca. He was born there. Okay. He had so a he father named Abdullah and a mother. First 40 years in Mecca, then he moved to Medina in 622. What else? Yeah, he had a father named Abdullah and a mother named Amina. He was a caravan trader. He had a wife named Khadija. One wife. That's the first one. Yeah. He claimed to see an angel in a cave and he became a prophet and spoke the and Quran. Received what? What did he receive? He, re he received the Quran, a recitation go. from God. So that was his mission. That was his primary mission, to receive a book called the Quran, to live in a place called Mecca, to start a religion called Islam, to be himself a Muslim. And all of this within within a 22-year period from 610 to 632. Am I correct? That's what they say. Okay. And you believe that, right, Scott? I did until I started to watch a lot of <laughs> Jay Smith videos. Okay. Why is it that you believe that? And why is it, Jody, that you believe that? Well, that's what all my Muslim friends used to take, uh, tell me. And so I never questioned whether until I met you or seen your videos, I always assumed that Muhammad existed. Maybe he was a false prophet like Joseph Smith or false prophet like, uh, you know, a lot of other false prophets we got. But, you know, I believe that Joseph Smith or Charles Taze Russell existed. But, I, you know, with the evidence, it's looking very bad whether Muhammad actually existed or not. Okay. And the first question you should ask is, why is it? It's not just Muslims that are telling you this. It's all every Western scholar that tells you this. Yes. It's every course you take. Uh -huh. It's every discussion you get in. Everybody only has one narrative, and that is that Muhammad existed, uh, lived in, uh, as you just said, in Mecca from 6, 570 to 622, and then moved to Medina, and then died in 632, received the Quran between 610 and 632, and created the religion we have today called Islam. Now, some Muslims may dispute whether he created it or not. That Many would say Abraham was a Muslim, Jesus was a Muslim, all the rest. Nonetheless, historically speaking, most people would, uh, would agree with what you have just said and what we have just said. But here's the problem. In order to under to see whether that is true or not, where did you get that material from? Or let, not where did you, where did those who gave it to you, where did they go to find out about this man named Muhammad, about this place called Mecca, about these people called Muslims and the book called the Quran? Where did they go to get that? We go to the imam or the mosque and then... Where did the imam go to? I'm going to keep backing you up. The scholars, the scholars. Where did the scholars go to? 
Uh, the hadith. They go to, to the, the hadith. hadith. Okay. Traditions. They went to the Sira, the Sira, which is the biography, right? That's Muhammad's life. Am I correct? According right. to the scholars, yes. Sira, well, that's according to everybody, not, not even the right. scholars, even me. I would say that is the biography. Now, and the Hadith, you said, Scott, so that would be the, the sayings of Muhammad. Am I correct? That's the saying. Now, where would you like those that biography and those sayings to have been written? When would you have liked those to be written? Well, and where would you have liked those to have been written? Well, I would, if I was a Muslim and I wanted to believe Islam was true, I would want it to, to be as early as possible, like, like the Bible, you know, just a few years, like 10, 20 years, or even 30 or 40 years, but not 200 years after supposedly. And the reason the you say that is because you want eyewitness account, right? Yes, I want like eyewitness we have with account. Jesus. Yes. Like we have with Jesus. Okay, I'm going to put up a PowerPoint. I'm just going to show you what we now know. I'll do this real quickly so you can follow through with me. You may have seen it before, but let's go ahead and put it up. Do you see the PowerPoint in front of you now? Yes, yes. we see it. All right. Now let's go ahead and let's let's go to the second. Let's just open it up. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go through all those areas. This is what they claim. They claim this is Muslims. And I would suggest everybody who's watching the show would claim that Muhammad was the last and greatest prophet, that the Quran was his revelation and Islam is the final. Now, now they wouldn't all say that, but Muslims certainly would say that. And the conclusion is that the Quran is their book. Muhammad is the man and Mecca is the place. Now, here's the problem. There's the life of Muhammad right in front of you. 570, he was born, saw and met uh, Jibril in the cave in 610, got the Meccan revelations from 610 to 622, went up to the seven heavens, uh, called the Miraj in 621, then moved to Medina in 622, received his revelations in Medina from uh, the next 10 years, conquered Mecca in 630, died in 632, possibly by poisoning. Now, as you, as you look at that timeline, let's put it and let's see where is it? Let's just put it on a timeline so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. There's what I'm talking about. Boom. That's the life of Muhammad there from, uh, from 570 to 632. All right. Then you have Abu Bakr who comes afterwards from 632 to 634. Then you have Umar who comes from 634 to 644, followed by Uthman for the next 12 years. And that's when the Quran is finally compiled. That's when the Quran was finally put together in its final form. So we're told the one that we have in our hands today. They he was killed and Ali comes over. And so that is what we know as the origin of Islam right there in one timeline. I'm giving you this timeline so you can see why this next, what I'm going to say next is important. Here's the problem. And here's the problem. When was this all written down? Well, we know Muhammad died in 632, according to the Sira. There's the Sira biography first written by Ibn Ishaq. Look at the date, 765, Muhammad died in 632. You're talking about 130 years later that it's finally written down, Right. Right. But we don't have that. We don't have Ibn Hisham. We have to go to this guy, Ibn Hisham, to find out really when it was written down. Now, Ibn Hisham died in 833, and he does. He pretty much takes what he likes of Ibn Ishaq and throws away the rest. So let's get rid of Ibn Ishaq. He's not important anymore. So Ibn Hisham, Hisham biography first. first written by Ibn Ishaq. Look I'm at sorry? the date, 765. I'm, I'm repeating myself. I hear myself coming back again. <laughs> so Ibn Hisham, 833. Now, after him comes al wikiri He's the second to write of the biography. Those look at his dates, 835. What about the sayings that Scott talked about? The sayings don't appear until Al-Buhari in 870, Sahih Muslim 875, Tirmidhi 884, Ibn Majah in 887, Abu Dawud in 899, and Anisai in 915. Can you see the problem? Are you seeing the problem here? We have two other genres of, of material that we have to look at. That's the Tafsir and the Tahrik. They don't appear until Al-Tabari introduces them in 923. So what's the problem here? Well, there's 200 years between the time Muhammad dies and Ibn Isham actually writes it down or dies himself. Now, on top of that, I also want to bring up Abdul Malik, because he is the first one that introduces the name Muhammad. He is the first one that introduces the name Muslim. He is the first one that introduces the name Islam. And he is the first one to have any, what we now know as Quranic text on his building and on his coins and on his protocols. Now, look at him. That's 141 years before Ibn Hisham. However, I want to bring up one more people, and that's the Abbasids. Because almost everything we know about Muhammad, about how Islam began, about the origins, 
all come from this group. It is the Abbasids who come to power in 749 that give us the Muhammad of today, that give us the place called Mecca, that give us the Hajj and all the five different uh, areas of the Hajj. They also give us everything that Muhammad said and did. And that is 84 years they had to get this material ready. It took them 84 years to finally get it correct. 84 years. Are you seeing that? But really, we're talking about 200 years that, that between the time Muhammad dies and Ibn Hisham, a good 80 more years be by the time the Abbasids finally give us the man we're talking about. Because we don't really even know who he is during the Umayyad period, which is during the time of Abd al-Malik. He just introduces him. Now let's look at all these. Let's look at where these guys who gave us this Muhammad and tell us about Islam, look at where they lived. Well, there's Mecca and Medina. According to standard Islamic narrative, everything's supposed to have taken place in Mecca and Medina, right? That's where the two green circles are. Yet, if you look and see where all the traditions were written, well, they were all written in Baghdad, which is a good 1,800 kilometers too far north. Basra is where Ibn Hisham uh, uh, is from. Basra, but he lived in Cairo, did his writing in Baghdad. You, Cairo is 1,600 kilometers further away. Basra is 1,800 kilometers away. When you look at Al-Buhari and all the sayings of the prophet, he is from Buhara, which is Uzbekistan today. That is 4,200 kilometers away. When we look at Al-Tabari, he is from Tabaristan in what is today Iran. That's uh, a good 2,800 kilometers. Can you see the problem? Look at the map. Are you getting the reason why we're bringing this up? Now, None of the traditional writers who wrote the traditions, who wrote about what Muhammad did, what he said, how Islam began, about the Quran, none of them lived or worked in Mecca, Medina. They were far too uh, much to the far in the north, uh, north of Medina, Mecca, and they came from the west and the east of Baghdad. All of these northern areas are where the Abbasids originated from. Here's the, let me just put it under respect it again. There's the Islamic tradition say it happened to those two cities now, yet all of the traditions worked in, uh, of those who wrote them, worked in Baghdad, 1,800 kilometers away. All of these areas are Abbasid. More than that, take a look at the bottom of your screen. Can you see where the traditional writers are on a timeline? They don't appear till 833, 870, 923. Conclusion, they all wrote the material hundreds of miles too far away and hundreds of years too late. And that's what we're getting at. And we're saying to people, You've got to wake up. Now, let's ask the same question of Christianity, because we've got the same thing. Christianity was written between uh, that, everything we know about Christianity, about who Jesus was, what he said and did, was written within 15 to 60 years of the times that they took place in the same period and in the same place. Let's put it on a timeline. Like I've just done with Islam, let's do it with Christianity. Now, I'm going to get some of you upset. I know, Scott, and, and Jody, you may not like the dates I'm going to give you. I'm giving you the most liberal dates I can. All right. I'm not going with conservative dates now. I'm going with the li most liberal dates. I'm doing this on purpose. So Jesus dies in 33 AD, right? The book of Acts, the Tariq, that would be the equivalent to their Tariq, which would be the history of all mankind. We have the history of the early church written by Luke between uh, 52 to 62 AD. So that's within 20 to 30 years of Christ's death, the uh, book of Acts is written. Paul's letters, they begin in 15 years after, Christ, after Christ's death, between 48 and 65 AD when he was finally killed. That's when the tafsir, that's the commentaries. Paul's letters are like the commentaries of, the, of Muhammad's life. So you have the commentaries of Jesus' life and what he said and did and how it was to be unpacked and used, how it was, how it was to be used in Ephesus or, or Philippi or Corinth. So those are Paul's letters. Now let's look at the actual, let's look at the actual Sira and the Hadith of Jesus. So the Sira would be the biography of Jesus, and the Hadith would be the sayings of Jesus. The first to written by, by Mark in 70 AD, that's 37 years later. Matthew and Luke come along later uh, at 80 AD, that's 47 years later. I'm using the most liberal dates I can. And then John comes even later, about 90 AD, that's 57 years later. Now what look at that, just look at those dates. Notice that everything we know about what Jesus said what he did about the history of the church and about the commentaries are all written within 60 years of Christ's death. And all of the New Testament writers lived in the same place Jesus lived. And they either knew him personally, or they got the material from others who saw what he did and heard what he said. Now that right there is the problem. That right there is the problem. Are you getting that, Scott yes. and Jody? 
It's that that yes. no Muslim wants to talk about. And the Muslims are finally understanding that if you're going to look at Muhammad, you've got to do the same thing I've just done with Jesus Christ. You've got to put and say everything you know about this man, everything you know what he said, everything you know what he did comes from two to three hundred years later. And they come from way up north. Why in the world are we trusting them, especially when we go back to the seventh century? We need to go back to that complaint, that time period. We need to go back to that place. We need to go to Mecca and Medina and see what we can find. And guess what we can find? Zero. There is nothing about Muhammad in the seventh century that we can see until 692. I lie, 691. Let's put it a year earlier. There is nothing, no reference to Mecca at all until 741. That's the mid eighth century. We can't find any of these Qurans that these Muslims are talking about, these Qurans that were written first by Abu Bakr in 632, the Quran that was finally written by Uthman in 652, sent to five different cities. We've gone to those five cities. Two of those cities didn't even exist in 652. Mecca and Basra were never there. Kufa could have been there, although it was called Hira at that time, and it wasn't Muslim. So can you see the problems here? All these enormous difficulties. So we're looking for these Qurans, and we can only find fragments, and even the 63 fragments that the Muslims have come up with from 621. That means prior to 621, 34 of them, no one's done any study on. They're just pulling them out of thin air. 20 of them come after, I mean, 10 of them come after 621, and the others that are left over, the other th uh, 30, I mean, I'm sorry, the other 20, we have no idea. There's so much speculation that no one can come to any agreement. So can you see that is desperation? That is desperation. The claims the Muslims have been claiming for 1,300 years. You notice I'm not saying 1,400. I'm saying 1,300 years, all we're doing is asking the same questions that were asked of our Bible, I've asked of Jesus Christ, I've asked of the early church, have been asked of the tafsir of, the, of the, his, his teaching. Those questions that were asked by Wellhausen back in, in the 1800s there at the school of Tubigan, we're now asking in the 21st century. And what we're finding is devastating. What we're finding is devastating. We now know that there was no place called Mecca. Just take that one. That one's the one that I introduced back in my first debate in 1995. 1995, I was debating, debating Dr. Jamal Badawi at Cambridge University. My first debate I've ever done. I was never trained to be a debater. And I gave 10 historical questions. Every one of those 10 questions I got from Dr. Patricia Kroner at Cambridge University. She was the one that introduced me to this material. I was in her office the week before, and she went right through and said, listed what I should say, what I shouldn't say, how better to say it, or what things I could actually support. And I took those 10 questions and I asked him there at Trinity College on, I think it was in either September or August, 1995. So we're talking about 26 years ago. The major question I asked him is this, where's Mecca? Why is it none of the Qiblas are facing Mecca? Now, see, this is before Dan Gibson even came out with his book. I knew this before Dan Gibson did. And I, well, I didn't know it before him. Sorry, that's not quite true. He knew it before I did, but he didn't, hadn't gone public with it yet. We knew this because Patricia Crone had asked this. She asked this way back in 1977 before, before Dan Gibson even got into this, this area. She said, why is it that none of the earliest Qiblas, that means the direction of prayer on any of the mosques, which should all be facing Mecca, none of them are facing Mecca. Now, she didn't know where they were facing. She thought that they were facing Jerusalem, as most of us did, as I did at that time. I thought they were all facing Jerusalem because I hadn't heard about Dan Gibson yet. Dan Gibson was the one that corrected us that, but he didn't get his book written until 2011. And he finally didn't get this book here written until 2017. And this has blown it out of the water. This book has blown it out of the water. Every one of you needs to get this book, Early Islamic Qiblas, full of pictures and timelines and graphs. It's really colorful. And it just destroys any notion that there was anybody who knew about a place called Mecca. They just did not. And you can see why. Just look on a map. If you look on a map, you will see why. There's nothing there. There was nothing there. The trade route that, that uh, Montgomery won, back in the 1900s, made famous, su su suggesting that all the trade went through Mecca, and that was why it got its importance. Dr. Patricia Crone blew that out of the water in 1987, when she, the first thing she did is say, look at a map from 7th century. There is no place called Mecca on any of these maps. 
There is, there is a place called Yathrib, which later became Medina. That's on the map. There is a place called Taif. There's a place called Nazran. There's a place called Sana. If you want to go above, there's a place called Chaibar and Tabuk and Gaza. These places are well known. They are on the Western Plateau. Take a look at them. They're up, up above. And these are oases. But these were not large places. They were just little hamlets. And every one of them only really only ever traded in leather and milk. That's about all she could find. So she wrote a whole book in 1987 called Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam just by going back. Now, see, this woman is amazing because she reads and writes 15 languages, all archaic languages. So she writes the very language. She reads the languages she's reading and is able to interpret and put it into English. And she went back to all the trading documents. She went from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, up until the eighth century. She went back to and also discovered where the letters were written from the receipts and looked at the languages and noticed that nowhere on any of the receipts on any of the trading documents could she find any reference to a place called Mecca at all. In fact, she found that the trade that was coming uh, over in the east from India all the way over to the Mediterranean world, the trade that was coming across the waters and Arabian Sea, none of it went through Mecca. It went right up the Red see for very good reason that's what you do you stay on the water it's the cheapest way to take any goods even today we still use the water and so she found out that all the trade went through agilis which is today eritrea it was all on the west it was now she didn't know this this is something i have just found in just the last two months she didn't go far enough and back in 1987 she assumed that the trade went up the red sea up to Jeddah and the Yanbu before it went up to Egypt. And I said, I said, take a look at them, take a look at a topography map from space, look down on the Red Sea, you can see where the channels are. And the channels are not at all on the east, they're over on the west, all the channels go along the western coast of the Red Sea, which is Africa, which is what she found in the trading documents. Remember, she found Agilis? Agilis is in Africa, it's in Eritrea today, which is just north of Ethiopia. And she didn't know this. We found this out. I found that out two months ago, that if you look and see where all the trade went, you need to see where the, where the, where the harbors were, where all the boats went to, where they would stop for provisions. There are five cities, five cities on the West African coast that have been there since the third century BC. Third century BC. Woo, doo, 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 doo. This is long before Islam even began. And we can't find any, 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 co any coastal town on the, on the Arabian side except for Yanbu. Yanbu was a coastal city that, uh, that was there for Yathrib to make sure to get a coastal city for, to accommodate Yathrib. There was no Jeddah. And this is the mistake I made back in February. I assumed Jeddah was an old city. I assumed Jeddah was created to accommodate Mecca and that, that it was created in second century BC. Little did I know that the sources I was getting off of Wikipedia were Muslim sources from 1500 AD. I should have never trusted them. And so I went back to my own my own professor, Dr. Gerald Hotting, who has written the book on Jeddah, he has the standard, the historical reference to Jeddah. And had I only read his book first, he was my professor, what I would have found out that actually Dr. Gerald Hotting says Jeddah did not exist until the 8th century. Jeddah was created to accommodate Mecca. Ooh, two, 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 two. If Mecca did not exist till the 8th century AD, remember, that's over a hundred years after Muhammad even died. Then how can you have Muhammad in Mecca? More than that, how can, how can you have Adam and Eve in Mecca? Because that's where Adam and Eve are sent to in chapter seven, verse 24 of the Quran. How can you have Abraham in Mecca? Look at chapter 21 of the Quran in verse 51 to 71. Abraham's in there. He's there going into the Kaaba, destroying all the idols, thrown into a fiery pit the next day. How can he be down that far south? There are no Jews in that far south at all in the 7th century, and certainly not in 1900 BC. In fact, there was nobody there in 1900 BC. Look at all the maps. Look at Ptolemy's maps. Look and see what he said. Ptolemy talks about a place called Makaraba, and all the Muslims have said, ah, this must be Mecca, until Dan Gibson showed where Makaraba is today. It's just north of Yemen. It's in northern Yemen, and it's no longer called Makaraba, and it's nothing more than a little hamlet, and it's nowhere near any place that has a mosque or that has a sanctuary. 
hundreds of miles away and way down to the south. Because see, all the civilizations in Arabia were either in the south, what's called the Hadramat, today it's Yemen and Oman, or in the north, which is called Jordan and Syria and uh, in, in Iraq today, but it was called Arabia Petraea but during the time of the Romans. Nothing in the middle. There was, this was called Arabia Deserta. Why do you think it was called Deserta? Because it's a desert. No one was there. There were no people. There were no civilizations. There were no kingdom. There was no trade. There was no nothing except for a little trade route that went up along the Western Plateau that, that was used for milk and leather. Can you then see why we're, the questions we're asking are destroying Mecca? Because if Mecca isn't there, then what are you going to do with Muhammad? What are you going to do with Muhammad? Scott, how would you answer that? Uh, you can't have a guy born in Mecca if there's no Mecca at the time. <laughs> you're born. You can't have, if you're not have Mecca. And then the next thing is, what about Muhammad then? What do we know about Muhammad? Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, this is, this is just almost every day now. I've just put up a video a day, a day ago. Just a video on Fander Films. Already 21,000 people have watched it in just one day. Why are so many people breaking all my records? I've never had this many people watch one film, one video, 16 minutes long in just the 24 hour period. Why? What's going on here? Look and see what we're finding. And what we're finding is what Luxembourg found, this guy found. We're looking at the Quran. We're looking at this book, Luxembourg, and also this book here, these two books. Can you get closer to John, the, the book so I can see? Syro-Aramaic. Okay, thank you. It's called the Syro-Aramaic Reader of the Quran by Christoph Luxemburg. This one is called, oh boy, it's not very good. The Hidden Origins of Islam. The Hidden Origins by, of Islam. It's very hard. I can see the light's not very good here. And that's written by, edited by Karl Heinz Oleg and Geb Quinn. But it's, the, Volker Pop is the, it's an edit of many different people who have written there. Volker Pop is the one you need to read. And also Karl Heinz Oleg. And what they're saying is this. When you look at the Quran, there's a number of problems. First and foremost, the Arabic in the Quran is the wrong Arabic for Mecca and Medina. Because the Arabic that was used in Mecca and Medina in the 7th century, if there was a Mecca, we know there wasn't, but there was a Yathrib, a saved Yathrib. The, the Arabic that was used there was Sabaic Arabic. Sabaic Arabic has diacritical marks. Isn't that interesting? Stop and think that through. It has diacritical marks. The Quran, however, if you look at all the earliest manuscripts, if you look at the Quran, the earliest manuscripts, here's one right here. This is considered to be one of the earliest manuscripts. This is the Topkapa manuscript. Can you see it there? There are no dots in it. Can you see it? This yes, is the Topkapa manuscript. Yeah. It's so the much book. different than the Quran now. This is the Topkapa manuscript, yeah. which is one of the six major manuscripts. By the way, you can't buy this anymore. This is over 400 pounds when I bought it. This manuscript is from the mid 8th century. It's about 749 that is now being dated. It has no dots above and below it. I lie, I lie. There are some dots in red. Let me see if I can give you an example. There, you can see some dots, but these were added at a later date. There's a dot there, there's a dot there, there's a dot. You can see they're in a completely different color, proving that they were added at a later date. The difficulty is... Once you start adding dots, remember, for, if for those of you who know Arabic, you have five dots, five diacritical marks that are added, three above the line, two below the line, three above the letter, two below the letter. If it's one dot above the letter, it's a na. If it's two dots above the letter, it's a ta. If it's three dots above the letter, it's a tha, like a th. If it's one uh, dot below the letter, it's a b, like a ba. And if it's two dots, it's a ya. So it could be na, ta, ta, ba, ya. Five different letters. But those, let, those dots didn't exist in the seventh century in the Quran. Therefore, they, this is, but dots did exist in Sabaic Arabic. What's more, the Quran that we have now, the Quran that we use now that has the dots and the vowels, three vowels, the dama, which is the, U, the E sound, sorry, the, uh, the Dhamma, which is the U sound, the Kasar, which is the E sound, and the Fata, which is the A sound. So U, A, and E. Those are put two above the line and one below the line. Those uh, vowels did exist also in the 7th century. That's why all of the earliest crowns don't have any vowelization. So no one knew what they were reading because there was only 16 letters. Today, there are 28 letters. 
And the reason there are 28 letters is because the dots were invented. In the late seventh century into the eighth century, they invented the dots. What, what Arabic therefore did, the, what Arabic only had 16 letters and had no dots and vowels? Do you know the answer? No, I don't know the answer. Nabataean Aramaic. Nabataean Aramaic is the Arabic that had no dots, no vowels, had 16 letters, had also had the dot. Now, this, for, this is only for people who know Arabic. The Aleph Maksura and the Dagar Aleph. And the Aleph Maksura, the Tar Marbuta, and the Dagar Aleph, and the definite article. Those four things all existed in Nabataean Aramaic. Those four letter endings are all found in the Quran we use today, in the Arabic of the Quran we use today, but does not exist in the Sabaic Arabic. Bingo! Can you see what I'm saying? Proving that the Quran did not come from Mecca, Medina, the Quran that we have in our hand today all came from up north, from the Nabataean area. Where is the Nabataean area? Try Petra. Lo and behold, from the same area Dan Gibson has found all the mosques facing, the city of Pekka, Petra, is exactly the same Arabic that we find in the Quran. But that's 600 miles further north. Oh, they get into so much more than that. Then you have this guy come along, Christoph Luxembourg, and he shows that almost all of the Quran, the Arabic in the Quran, or the, I'm sorry, not the Arabic, the writings in the Quran were first written in Syro-Aramaic, which comes from Syria. Syriac is another name, what we call Syriac today. It's that Syriac that the Christians used at that time. All the Christians in Damascus, all the Christians coming down to what is today Petra, they would have used a, a, a secondary form called Nabataean Aramaic and Syriac Aramaic are both similar types of Syriac. And it's the Christians who wrote them who then uh, had them written all, the Arabs then took them and put them into what is today called the Quran. But as they put them into the Quran, they started changing it because of the fact that the dots and the vowels started to be invented. So by the time of the 8th century comes around, when they're incorporating all these stories of Jesus, all these stories of the prophets, and you see the prophets all the way through the Quran, there's 24 of these prophets in the Quran. These stories are all borrowed out of Syriac writings and Jewish apocrypha writings. You put the two together and you get the Quran. When you look at the Quran and you go back to the Syriac, suddenly you realize that most of the references to the praised one, in fact, almost every reference to the praised one is Jesus Christ. Now, who is the praised one in the Quran today? Muhammad. Muhammad. His name, Muhammad, means the praised one. It is not a name. <laughs> it's a title. It's a title. The praised one. It's what all the people call themselves. All the prophets refer to them, but especially the Christians refer to this character, the praised one, as Jesus Christ. And it is Jesus Christ who gets into the crown as Muhammad, who then is made a man called the prophet Muhammad by the Abbasids. It's the Abbasids then give us the Muhammad, the man. It is the Abbasids who then give us the man who lives in Medina. And then, I'm sorry, in Mecca, and then moves to Medina. It's the Abbasids who give us the backstory, who give us the saying, who give us the biography. It's the Abbasids who took them 200 years to finally get it out. Remember, remember, even they admit that when Al-Buhari is supposed to write the sayings of Muhammad, he is given 600,000 of these stories about this man, Muhammad, and he whittles them down, digga, 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 and throws them out, throws out, throws out, and only retains 7,397, which means he only retains 2% and throws out 98%. Does that not tell you that there is a, there is a censorship, the standardization going on by the Abbasids? The Abbasids created the Muhammad we have today. The Abbasids had to find a place for their, for their uh, uh, sanctuary. They could not use Petra. Remember, Petra was the Umayyad sanctuary. Well, the Petra was where all the Umayyad mosques are facing. Petra was where all the pilgrims went to. Petra had the black stone. And wherever the black stone is, there is God's presence. And when Abdul Zubair rebelled against Abdul Malik there in 687 and destroyed Petra and grabbed the black stone and ran down to the south, where do you think he ran to? Well, he ran to where his birthplace was, where he came from. 
which looks like it was Mecca, that region called Mecca. But he needed, he, needed, he needed to have allies, and that's why he asked the Abbasids, who were more than willing to be his ally, because they absolutely hated, they hated the, uh, the Umayyads, because the Umayyads were the Arabs who were the ones that destroyed them. And that's why they, living up in Stesiphon, which then later became Baghdad, they then finally took control, wrested control from the Umayyads. By that time, they now had Zubair, they had the Black Stone, they had now Mecca. So they recreated Mecca like they had in Petra. Everything you see in Petra is now in Mecca, but a smaller facsimile form. Can you see what I'm saying here? We pretty much can now find how Islam began. We can see where it went. We can see that Islam did not came out of a Christian heresy. It was a monophysite uh, attack against the monophysites. It was Abdul Malik who, who creates, starts this creation of attack against Jesus. And that's what he does by building the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock sits right there in Jerusalem. Of all things, why does he build such a large building in Jerusalem when he's not from Jerusalem? He's from Damascus. And if he is a Muslim, why doesn't he build it down in Mecca? Well, because Mecca didn't exist that early. There was no Mecca. And his sanctuary did not exist. Sorry, his sanctuary was in Petra. So why didn't he build it in Petra? Look and see what they, why the Dome of the Rock was built. And all you need to do is look at the structure. It's a Byzantine structure. Look and see where it's placed. It's placed above the Temple Mount, where the Temple of David used to be. It's also placed above the Church of the Sepulchre, looking down on the Church of the Sepulchre. And what was the Church of the Sepulchre? What is it still today? It's the bastion, it's the seat of where all the pilgrims, the Christian Byzantine pilgrims came to for pilgrimage. Therefore, it's a one-upmanship looking down onto the Serpical, uh, Church of the Sepulchre, saying, we are the new man on the block. We are the new power. And what does he do? Look at the inscriptions all the way along the inner and ambulatories. Take a look at those inscriptions, and they are all attacking our Lord Jesus Christ. They're attacking his divinity, attacking the Trinity, attacking his sonship, and saying that we are now going to take and destroy the associates. Who are the associators? That's us. We are known as the associators because we associate another with God. They, we have elevated, they say, another man, another prophet alongside God, Jesus Christ. So and when you look at history, when you follow history, when you look and see at the buildings, when you look at the Qiblas, when you look at the manuscripts, when you follow and see what's happened with the Arabic, when you look and see what's happened with Mecca, in almost every case, we can now point that Islam evolved, did not, was not, did not exist at all in the seventh century, was not created between 610 and 632 in a 22-year period. There's no way in the world it could have, not in Mecca, not that far south, and not with these tr tr uh, traditions. Take a look at all the sophistication in the Quran itself. Look at the laws and rules and regulations. These are come from an urban environment. They do not come from a nomadic environment. Mecca or Medina were not urban. They're, they were desert. There was nothing there. How could you have created a book like this that early? Obviously, it comes from much further north, and as we now know, it looks like the Quran was probably written in Kufa. Why do I know that? Take a look at these. Do you see what I have here? Every one of these is a Quran. Nine of them. Not one of them is the same. These are known as the Qira'at Qurans. These are the way you memorize the Quran. You memorize it 30 different ways. Today, 30 different ways ways. I only have nine of 30 that exist. And yet, if you look at the 30, 12 of them come from one city, Kufa, the city of Kufa. Now, Muslims will say these are nothing more than dialects. No, they're not. How can you have 12 dialects in one town that, wasn't more, that was not more than 20,000 people? Dialects take years to form. They take hundreds of years to form. You cannot have you cannot have 20, 12 different dialects in a little town of 20,000 people that, have, that were created in, a year, in only 20 years. Can you see the problem? Actually, let's put it more, 50 years. These have nothing to do with dialects. When you look at them, you can see these are completely different words. These have completely different meanings. How many? We have counted 93,000 differences. Just between these two right here the two most popular Qirats in the world today. This one, let me just put them right side up. This one is the most popular. Let's get it so you can see it. This one is the most popular today. It is the Hafs Quran. 
This is the second most popular today. It is the Warsh Quran. Neither of these two Qurans are from Mecca and Medina. Neither of these two Qurans are even from Arabia. This one is from Iraq. This one is from Egypt. This one was written in 796. When did Muhammad die? 632. This has nothing to do with Muhammad. This one was written in 812. When did Muhammad die? 632. This has nothing to do with Muhammad. Yet these are the two most popular Qurans today. If you just compare these two Qurans, there are 5,000 different words, different meanings, different doctrines, different practices, different beliefs. Can you see how damaging this is? Can you see why that interview by Yasser Qadi and Muhammad Hijab just over a year ago did so much damage to the Quran? Because Yasser Qadi, the world leading authority on the Quran, could not answer that question. Which of these Qurans is the one that's in heaven? Which is the one that was revealed to Muhammad? Which is the one that was there written by Uthman? He couldn't even answer that after 28 minutes when Muhammad put his hand out twice and said, I'm giving you a blank sheet of paper. Which one are you going to write? Look what his answer was after 28 minutes. They're all the Quran. Every one of these is the Quran. All 93,000 differences is the Quran. Can you see why he has become a laughing fool? Yet he was honest. He was actually being honest. He was the first one that admitted it in public that this has been the most difficult problem for Muslims for the last thousand years. Because no Muslim can now say that the Quran has been preserved. Not when you have 30 different Qurans, all in Arabic. None of these are translations. These are all supposedly original Qurans. Woo, doo, 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 doo. Thank God we don't have this problem with our Greek manuscripts. Thank God we don't have this problem with the Bible. We don't even make these claims because, see, Muslims, Muslims, Every Muslim has to make the three claims, well, four claims, that the Quran is eternal. Number one, that's chapter 85, verse 22 of the Quran. That the Quran has never changed. That's in chapter 10, verse 15. That's in chapter 18, verse 27. That the Quran is guarded by Allah himself. That's in chapter 15, verse 9. And that since the, uh, since the Quran was written down and finalized by Uthman in 652, not one word, not one letter has changed. Ooh, two, 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 two. <laughs> Can you see what we've done in just the last year? We have destroyed the Quran. We are destroying Muhammad. We've destroyed Mecca. Without Mecca, without Muhammad, without the book. That means without the book, the man in the place, the book and the man in the place, we are bringing Islam to its knees. And all we're doing is asking the same questions that have been asked of Christianity, which means we are the best place to ask these questions because we've answered them all for the Bible and Jesus Christ. Therefore, we know the power of historical criticism, of redacted criticism, of source criticism. We know the power of textual criticism, of lower and higher literary criticisms. We are not the ones that invented those criticisms, but we are the ones that matured them on the Bible. The Bible has gone through every one of those criticisms. This book has broken every one of those criticisms. It is the only one that has been asked them. It is the only one that has not been found wanting. It is the only one that has answered every question. Thank God for the Bible. And thank God I don't have to defend this book. Thank God I don't have to defend the man behind this book, nor the place behind this book. Thank God I want to see this book come crashing down because, folks, we need to bring him home. We need to bring him home. Now, I'm sure you have lots of questions. Throw them at me. I'll try to answer them as best as I can. Well, okay. Thank you, Jay. I just want to uh, say that I'm uh, thankful to everyone for being respectful in the Zoom meeting. I'm going to ask that you please raise your hand if you want to ask a question live and I will call on you. Or if you want to uh, put your question in the, in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube chat, depending on where you're at, I'll read it out. This is a moderated meeting. It's not a free for all. So please uh, look for that raise hand button on my screen. It's on a reactions menu, maybe somewhere else for you. And if you uh, have a question that you want to ask live, do that. Uh, but let me start with uh, a question. Jay, I want to focus back in on the person of Muhammad. Uh, we, we, uh, you, you mentioned there were coins and inscriptions around 691 that we see with the word Muhammad on it. But we're not just looking for that word. 
uh, Muhammad, which is a title. And even if it's a name, many people can have the same name or the same title. We're looking for a particular Muhammad with, you know, these parents, Abdullah and Amina, who, who was the caravan trader, who had this wife, Khadija. This particular man, when do we get his history first appearing? 833. 833. We have so, nothing before 833 on just what you've said. because 200 years later. Appear, those all appear suddenly out of thin air from Ibn Hisham. Now stop and thought, think that through, Scott. That's 200 years. What happened in the intervening 200 years? Why is it we didn't know about Amina? Why is it we didn't hear about Abdullah? Why is it we didn't hear about Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, or Ali before this? Why is it we can't find any reference to these people that surround his life prior to 833? Yeah, that's, that was going to be my next question. Muhammad had these, uh, these companions, the Sahaba. I, I can never find a, an exact number. Some say 100, some 150. Why didn't any of the Sahaba write anything down? Muhammad had 11 to 13 wives. Why didn't the, the wives write anything down? Mama had, uh, Muhammad had this tribe, the Ansari, uh, a, a big group of people. Why didn't the Ansari write anything down? Uh, uh, what about Surely his enemies were upset with this person, Muhammad. Why didn't they tell us? I'm upset with this person, Muhammad, and all that he's doing. He was this great conqueror. Where is the written documentary history of this? Is there anything? What about all these inscriptions in the desert uh, that I've heard about in the, in the Arabian Peninsula? Do we have anything with this particular Muhammad? Not, you know, the name. Right, and Scott, the you're asking about three or four questions, so let me try to wrap them all up in one answer. Sure. The, the, the answer, very simple, is, and what Muslims will say, as well, how they'll respond to this, is that people could not read and write that early. They're, they had to memorize. They memorized everything. They didn't need to write it down. Memory was much better. They say, even today, the entire Quran can be, can be memorized by millions of people all over the world. Even young children can memorize it. That's why we as Arabs, we memorize better than you, uh, you Americans. That's what they always respond. Now, here's the problem with that. If memory is that good, why then did Abu Bakr, according to their traditions, have to write it down immediately after the Battle of Yamama when 70 of theirs, according to their traditions, I'm going to keep on saying according to their traditions, died in the Battle of Yamama? If 70 caused such a crisis, then of course you need to ask yourself, why didn't it get written down? Very simply, because if you die and you memorize it, you, your memory goes with you in your death. So that's the first problem. Secondly, are you telling me that from all the way from Tripoli in the West to Afghanistan in the East, no one can read and write? What about Baghdad? What about Stesiphon? What about Kufa? What about Basra? What about Damascus? What about Jerusalem? What about any of these ancient cities? Do you notice all these cities had people could read and write. Alexandria had an entire library on the 5th century that got burned down. You can't burn some, a library down unless there are books. More than that, don't the Muslim traditions, don't, doesn't Al-Buhari say that a guy named Zaid ibn Thabit wrote down the Quran? The Quran was written mm -hmm. down in 632. Isn't Zaid ibn Thabit a secretary? What do secretaries do if they don't write? So you cannot get away from this that was not written down. You cannot get away from this that nobody, the Sahaba or the 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 um the, all these companions of the prophets did not know how to read and write. Women knew how to read and write. Men knew how to read and write. There's lots of writing. That's why we're going back to that writing. But the writing we're going back to is from the 7th century. You notice Patricia Corona went all the way back to the 2nd century. And she went and looked at all these documents from the 2nd to the 7th century. She's one of the unique people in the world that can do that. You and I can't do that. But we can go back to the Syriac. We can go back to the uh, 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 Syro Aramaic. We can go back to the Nabataean Aramaic. We can look and see what was written there. We can go back to people like Sophronius who is the bishop there in Jerusalem. And he is talking about a man named Umar. But that Umar did not live way down in Medina. That Umar actually lived much further north. It looks like they could be. And his name also was Muhammad. That was his nickname. Because the praised one, they all took that on as a title. So it was fascinating that you were correct. There were many Muhammads at that time. We need to find out which is the one that the, ninth, the 8th and ninth century is finally built upon. That Muhammad is not on, on any of the rock inscriptions. Take a look at the rock inscriptions. You mentioned them. They all come from further north and further south. Nothing from mm. the middle. No rock inscriptions from the middle. The people did not write in the middle? No, because there were no, there were no people there. That's why it didn't come from the middle. Mm. Look at the coins. Look where the mints are. They're all up in the north. No mints at all in the, in the area that, of Mecca Medina, the Hijaz. They're all either in the east over in Iran, what is Iran today, or in the West, what is Israel and Jordan and Syria? 
and take a look at those coins. See, the beautiful thing about rock inscriptions and coins, Scott, is that both of them do not deteriorate. They don't disintegrate. They are as pristine today as the day they were minted, almost as pristine. And when you look at them, you will notice that all the coins in the West, all the coins in the West have crosses on them, that the different leaders have crosses on them. Mu'awiyah has a cross above his head and he's holding a cross. How can Mu'awiyah, who comes to power in 661 and rules to 680, for the 20-year period, he's supposed to be the first Umayyad Caliph. He's supposed to be a Muslim. He says nothing about Muhammad. He has a cross above and below his head. The coins that he mints in the East all have Zoroastrian fire altars. Nothing about Muhammad, nothing about Islam, nothing about the Quran, nothing about anything that we should know about being Islamic. And that's why we're questioning it. When you look at the artifacts of the 7th century, when you look at the rock inscriptions, Muhammad is introduced in 690. He becomes, the, the traditions about him start to be introduced on the rock inscriptions in about 620. In about 630, he actually becomes a prophet. That's when he's introduced as a prophet. That is 730, though. That's 100 years after Muhammad died. Did I say 630? I meant 730. 730 on the inscriptions, he starts to take on the form of a prophet, a man. By 740, you then get the five pillars introduced. So you're starting to see the religion starting to be introduced. By the time the Abbasids take over in 749 and then destroy everything Umayyad, they then bring everything down further down south, down to the Hijaz. And that's why then Mecca then takes on importance. But that doesn't happen until about 750, because then after 760, and 770, all the other mosques start to face Mecca, but not until the Abbasids force them to do so. And it's not till 800s that finally all the mosques are, I think it's 822 is the last date that we find a mosque that's not facing Mecca. That 822 is about when the biography is then written, because once you have the book and the man in the place, then you need to have a backstory. And once the backstory is written by his bi bi biography, that's an 822. Then you get the saying, that's an 870, and then you get the tafsir and the tariq, that's still not till 923. So can you see, this is all evolving, and it's all taking place. You ask the question, Scott, why is there nothing there? There was lots there. It was all destroyed. It was all destroyed by the Abbasids. So we have nothing from the Umayyads, except these inscriptions, which they couldn't destroy, except the coins, which they couldn't destroy, except the mosques, which they couldn't destroy. That's the beauty of it. And it's we, if we aren't going to cry out, the rocks are going to cry out for us. Even, haven't I heard that before? And it's where by right looking out. at the rocks, by looking at the coin, by looking at the inscriptions, by looking at the buildings that were recreating while Islam actually began. And it had nothing to do with a man named Muhammad. It had nothing to do with a place called Mecca. It had nothing at all to do with a Sahaba, because even the Sahaba that you're talking about, the reference for their names comes from the 9th and 10th century. Nothing comes from earlier. Bingo. You've got a problem. I mean, you don't. Islam has a problem. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. I have two questions from our guests that are related to the, this one that I just asked and are similar questions. So I'm going to put them together. Predicator said, so who was actually the person named Muhammad told in all the stories in the Hadiths? And Strong Tower asks, was Muhammad a fictional character based on a real person? Yes and no. He was not. He wasn't based on any person that we know from the seventh century. There was nobody who lived in Mecca who did what he did or uh, or said what he said. That we can pretty well say is fictional. However, you, as you can see, look at, I mean, let me just give you an example. This has been done many times before. Robin Hood, do you know who Robin Hood is? Yes, sir. King Arthur, do you know who King Arthur is? King of Britain. Did he have a, a, a court named Camelot? Yeah. Did he have a round table? Yeah, and a stone that he, or a sword that he pulled out of a stone out called Excalibur. So all these knights, do you know mm -hmm. of, of any reference for him historically? No. Zilch. Can you see the problem? Even someone as late as King Arthur, you, we've all grown up with King Arthur. We've seen movies about him. We've seen Disney has done all kinds of cartoons. We all believe King Arthur exists. There was no person called King Arthur. But you have all kinds of backstories about what he said, about songs that he sang, about Guinevere and all about uh, all the great knights that he had. Sir Lancelot and Sir this and Sir that and Sir other. All these different sirs, all of them are fictitious. Yet, ask any child or ask any of, in fact, except for you, Scott, I would imagine many of the people who are listening think that King Arthur actually existed. This is all historical. Robin Hood did exist, 
But did he live in the Sherwood? Possibly. Did he do what he did? No, this is all fiction. And this is what happens, especially, especially if it's religious a character. If it's someone who becomes the model for all of mankind, if he's the arbiter between man and God, can you see an enormous amount of fiction? It is fiction is then introduced about him. Now, the next question you're going to ask, well, then why is it so embarrassing? It's not embarrassing to Muslims. It's embarrassing to us because he's nothing like Jesus. And we're looking at all these embarrassing stories in the Hadith, in the, uh, in the Siddha, about Muhammad, and saying, how could they have written this when they're not thinking, you're not thinking as a Muslim? Because when I ask Muslims this, they say, so what's the problem? Where's your beef? So he went to bed with 30 women in one night. Ooh, he's a, the guy was virile. So he married a woman when she was only seven years old. That's exactly what I would expect a man of 53 to, to do. Because that's what we must have. Um, a prophet must be able to marry anybody he wants. So he has 12 women at one time. Of 12 wives at once, though it says in the Quran, you can only have four. He's a prophet. He is elevated way above anybody. They don't see this as a problem. They don't see it. So he was seduced by, by, uh, by, by Satan for the satanic verses. Yes, but then look and see what happened. He was able to conquer that. So he had delirium and he had all these epileptic fits. Yes, but do you see what happened later? Every prophet has crisis, but they come out of the crisis and God helps them and they, they dis defeat the crisis. Same with Muhammad. See, these are not embarrassing stories for Muslims. And for 20 years, I was going doing what David Wood did and Sam Shamoon did, going and throwing all these barbs, barbs, barbs against Muhammad. And I wasn't getting anywhere because the Muslims were trying to understand why I was saying this. They thought it was hate crime. They thought I was being Islamophobic. I would be called Islamophobe all the time, a hate preacher. And I was. I mean, it's that close to hate preaching. The problem was they didn't get it because they don't see any of these as problems since he'd Every one of them began as problems, but then were reduced to a great story, a great prophetic story, how God came and helped him get over these problems. And that's exactly what a prophet of God would do. And don't we also see that in also all of our biblical prophets? Don't all of our biblical prophets have a crisis? Don't they have a weakness? And then don't they over overcome that weakness through God's help? And then because of that, become stronger because of it? Yes. So why don't we be careful about all these barbs we're throwing out against Muhammad? I would rather say, let's forget about all these stories that were created in the 9th and 10th century. Let's go back to the 7th century and let's destroy this man from history. Because then they have nothing to fall back on. I want to get rid of the Muhammad that's in the 9th and 10th century just by simply asking questions from the 7th century. Where did this man live? Who was he? What did he say? How did he come to be? When there was no place, there was not even a place called Mecca that he was supposedly lived in. Now, that's much more devastating, and there's nothing hateful about what I'm saying there. Do you notice? You cannot call me an Islamophobe. You cannot call me a hate preacher. All I'm doing is asking historical questions, which is the most neutral of questions, which means anybody can ask it, but I want only Christians to ask this. I really only want Christians to ask this. I know a lot of atheists love to use this material, but I say to the atheists, please don't use it because you have nothing to give them. You have no alternative. You have no antidote. You have no answer. We are the only ones that can destroy the Quran and offer them the Bible. We are the only ones that can confront Muhammad and offer them Jesus Christ. We are the only ones that can destroy the place called Mecca and offer them the celestial kingdom. Amen. We are the only ones that can bring them home. <laughs> That's why, folks, we are the only ones that really should be in this debate. We are the only ones that really should be taking this to them. You're not going to be hated because of this. You're not going to be hurt. You will be harassed. Of course you will. But you're not going to be put in prison because of being an Islamophobe, not with this material. And that's why I say we need to start using this material because we understand it best and we are the only ones that have an answer. Hope that answers your question. No. So it a, seems like what you're saying is even the Quran says, ask the people of the book. So they should be asking us. Chapter 10, verse 94, chapter 21, <laughs> verse 7, chapter 4, verse 136. Just go. If you have any questions, come to us. Come to the people of the book. Why? Chapter 5, verse 46 and 47, and also verse 68. Oh, Christians, we're to go back to our book because that's how we're to measure what we meet. So even we are told by the Quran to go back to our book. So come on home. Come on home. We got the bigger, the better book.
Right. Um, what do you think the odds is that the maybe this religion started out as a Christian cult? Have you ever been asked that or or? Yes. And I would suggest the odds are getting better and better. I mean, this is the thesis behind this book here. It's oh, also okay. the thesis behind this book. And that is if you look at see what Islam came out. I mean, Patricia Krut asked this question back in 1977 with her book called Hagarism where it came from a Hagar, Hagar, Hagarian cult from the, uh, the person called Hagar, the, the uh, mother of Ishmael, this Ishmael cult. Now, what we're finding is looks like much of that area, once the Byzantines had destroyed the Sassanids in 622, interesting date, isn't it? 622. Then they, of course, took the mat, they threw on the mantle, uh, the suppressive mantle off the Arabs that were there in what no, was known as the Ghassan in the Lakhmid areas. Once the mantle was thrown off from all the suppression, these Ghassanids, these Lakhmids wanted to start ruling their own kingdoms, but they had all these little kingdoms. It wasn't until Mu'awiyah brought them all together in 661. So what was happening there? Well, you can ask, who, was, who were these people? These were Christians. Many of them were monophysites. Some of them were Nestorians. But there were different factions of Christians. So you can see there was in this internecine, fight, internecine fighting going on in the 7th century. And that's why when you finally get to Abdul Malik, who is the caliph, he then is the largest ruler. He is the great, known as the great Arab reformer. He then plants his name and his, uh, he then plants his shahada on his, his coins, on the Dome of the Rock, and on the protocols in 691 and 692. So he is the first to then say, this is the religion we're going to follow. Now, when he's saying, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, is he saying, Muhammad the Rasulullah, is that Muhammad, is that Muhammad the, is the prophet, or the praised one is the prophet? To answer that, you should go to the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock is only referring to Jesus Christ. So when it says the praised one is the servant of Allah, who do you think it's referring to? Well, what are all the other scriptures referring to? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So I would suggest that it looks like, even on the Dome of the Rock, the earliest chronic material we have, that the Muhammadur Rasulullah, the praised one, is the servant of God. That's what Jesus is called in the Quran, the servant of God. He is known as that. And all the people knew him as that. So you can see that this probably was a Christian sect that was reforming itself. And as it then took on form by the 730s and 740s, then the praised one then gets, gets solidified into the man, Prophet Muhammad. I don't think Abdul Malik is, I used to think Abdul Malik was one to introduce him. I think that's too early. 690 is too early. This took another 40 years to finally create the man called Muhammad. But once you do have a man named Muhammad, then you've got to give him a book. Can you then understand why in the 8th century the Quran is hurriedly put together and take a look at the Quran. It is ulta puta. It's all over the place. It has no chronology. It has no, and it doesn't have any complete, ah, oh, there's only one complete story in the Quran. What a hopeless book and what a hopeless way of writing a book. Yet that makes sense if you're trying to put it together and borrow it from all over the different sources. And they borrowed it from the wrong sources. They went to the Jewish apocryphal writings and they went to the Christian Syriac writings, the sectarian writings, which are all Heretical. Well, not all, but the ones they took were heretical because their interest was to create a monotheism that was based on one God, and they didn't want any human to be part of that. So that's why almost everything they did borrow was fit their theology, and their theology was very Aryan in nature. I have a question from the audience. Someone has raised their hand. Faree, uh, go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask your question. And if I've mispronounced your name, please correct me. <laughs> It's all right, Scott. Thank you, uh, Scott and Jody and Dr. Jay for tonight's uh, teaching. So my question is, uh, when uh, to prove the historical Muhammad, usually Muslim uh, bring up the Muhammad grave and or Khadija house. Do you have any information, uh, histor uh, archaeological information about this? Thank you. Absolutely zero information because look what they're doing to those very artifacts. They're covering them up with cement. If that was really Khadija's house and she was the wife of Muhammad for 40 years, why in the world have they destroyed it and covered it up? Bingo. Now, Dan Gibson went to a conference a number of years ago, about 10 years ago, I think it was, maybe it's less. And he was at a conference in the Middle East with archaeologists. He's an archaeologist. He has an archaeological conference. He went up to the Saudi Arabians that were there. And he went and he asked them, 
what have you been able to find in Mecca archaeologically? Because listen, you're building these enormously tall buildings. The fourth highest building in the world, that clock tower, tower has already been built. Looking down over the Kaaba, they're going to build 62 of these skyscrapers all around Mecca or all around the Kaaba. Sorry, that central part of a Mecca. When you build a skyscraper, you have to dig down into the ground, right, to get foundations. And you have to dig deep in those foundations. And as you dig those foundations, you come across artifacts. Am I correct? This yeah. happens in every archaic city. Go to Damascus, go to Jerusalem, go to London and look what happens. Whenever they're going to build a skyscraper, the archaeologists show up. Why? Because they want to see what they're digging out of the ground. They have the mechanisms to do so. Archaeologists don't. And they start bringing up all these artifacts, trinkets and all kinds of pottery and all kinds of artifacts that have that tell the history of that city. So he went to these archaeologists and says, what have you found? They said, we have found nothing prior to 1299. The oldest thing they can find is an old Ottoman hmm. fort built after 1299. Nothing from before. <laughs> <laughs> what does that tell you right there? Archaeologically Islam. speaking, there is nothing there prior. Now, I'm sure that they will find something that should be earlier in there because we know it's Mecca would have sure. existed by the 8th century. So they should start to find something by the 8th century. But as far as Khadija's house or any of these, no, these don't exist. It sounds All right, like now we have a question from a goose. Uh, get, 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 get ready. Uh, Jay, I just want to ask. Which came first, Islam or Muhammad, according to sources outside the Islamic tradition? Thank you. Did you get that question? Sorry. It's yes. in the chat room. Which came first, Islam or Muhammad, according to sources outside the Islamic tradition or standard Islamic narrative? Okay. So which question. one yeah. came first? Yeah. Okay. Islam would have come first because it's introduced on the Dome of the Rock. The word Islam. The, uh, but remember, what does Islam mean? It's submissive, right? Submission. I am in submission. So someone who is a Muslim, you put a mu, it's a person who is in submission. So mm. Muslim, mu Islam would be someone who submits. So that's all it means. It means nothing more than that. So that was first introduced in 691. Muhammad looks like as a person is not introduced to about 730, 740. <clears throat> Another 40 years later. There is another question too from the chat room. If Mecca is in Petra in Jordan, but why Muslims go to Mecca in Saudi Arabia? If Mecca was in Petra. If Mecca is in Petra, Jordan, but why Muslim go to Mecca in Saudi Arabia? Okay. I think I think I, the I, question I think the question is like in, uh, no, I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. It's not that Mecca was in Petra. That was never called right. Mecca. I think it's a Kaaba. I think it's the 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 Kaaba. Yeah. Uh, the the what Kibla. The Kibla is in Petra. If the Kiblas yeah. are all going to Petra, that was the Umayyad sanctuary. Mm -hmm. The Umayyads were defeated by the Abbasids in 749. The Abbasids want nothing to do with the Umayyads. It was the Abbasids that chose Mecca. Therefore, they redirected. And so that's why the first mosque that you see facing Mecca is not till 727. Right. All the mosques prior to 706 are all facing Petra. In 727, you get the first mosque facing Mecca, which suggests the Abbasids are now starting to build their mosque. But look and see where that mosque is located. It's located in what is today Pakistan. Mm -hmm. That's about as far away as you can get. Thousands that's of miles true. away that you finally have the first Abbasid influence of a mosque that's facing Mecca. Then you start to you get about another nine to 10 mosques that start facing Mecca after 727. After 749, when they come to power and defeat the Umayyads, then all the mosques start facing Mecca. But it takes them to about 822 to get all the mosques to face Mecca because there's still some holdouts. There's still some people who refuse to be under their authority, especially over in North Africa. Now, when getting back to the, his uh, earlier question, what about the Kaaba? Take a look. You will find a Kaaba in Petra. It's actually the right size. If you look at the foundations, mm -hmm. and Gibson shows you the Kaaba, if you look at the foundations, they fit exactly the measurements that Azraki talks about in the traditions. The Kaaba in Mecca is too small. It's the wrong dimension. So they're trying to replicate the one in Petra. 
Absolutely. That's exactly what's going on, Lin, Lin Si. And on top of that, Lin Si, if you look and see, look at Marwa and Safa, the two mountains that Hagar runs between to find water. Look in Mecca today. There's no mountains there. They're just rocks 15 feet high. That's not a mountain. I do not call a rock of 15 feet high a mountain. Look in Petra. No, I believe that. No, I remember that story. However, we're going to even change that story next week. Ooh. Next week, we have found a new Marwa and Safa. Wait I remember that well. story because my, my Ustad kept telling me about the, uh, that two mountains that Hagar running between uh, Fatma uh, and Marwa. And now, now I'm out of Islam, come to Christ. I can see all clearly. And folks, I was embarrassed. <laughs> if I'm a hey, Muslim, me, I'll be embarrassed too. Lindsay, let me show you what's <laughs> happened since 1980. Look how odd, how idiotic this gets. You know the Jamarat. The Jamarat is the pillar that they throw stones at, right? When yes, you were yes, them, yes. You had yes. to throw 49 stones or 72 yes. stones. When, before 1980, it was always just one Jamarat, right? Yep. If you go to Petra, the Jamarat's there. You can see the base for it, one Jamarat. Mm -hmm. Go to Petra, I mean, go to Mecca today. You will see three Jamarats. Mm -hmm. What happened to one? Why three suddenly? Well, the devil is getting bigger. There you go. <laughs> and what do they say now? Since 1980, what they're saying is the Jamarat is not a place to throw at the devil. These are the three times that the devil came to... Uh, to, 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 to they make a story. Yeah. Abraham. <laughs> so these are the three tests of the devil by Abraham. That has just been crazy since 1980. That's in my lifetime, in your lifetime. So even as we speak, they're still creating new traditions. Yeah. Can you then understand, Scott, when you asked, how is it that these traditions are off the Ansari? How did they all create them by the ninth century? They're still creating them in the 21st century. The reason they had to build three Jamarats is because there's too many people. They could not have everybody throwing stones at one place. So they had to build three to accommodate the huge millions of people coming to, to Mecca. And now mm. they built three levels. It's just a matter of time before they'll build a fourth and a fifth. Right. So they're going to have to come up with another new tradition. So it's every, time, every time they build something new around Mecca, there's going to be a new story. A new story, the... a new tradition, <laughs> a new hadith. Exactly. New, so I will say in, in Mecca, where the black rock is, the, the, the black Kaaba, uh, in that area where you, you stone the devil, the same place also where Allah lives. So... Well, Allah is tell you. where the black stone is. Now, let me ask you, Lindsay, as a Muslim, can you kiss something or can you revere something, any object? Mm -mm. I've never been there, so I, so, I don't think so. Just hypothetically, I'm asking, I know no. you haven't been there, but are you permitted, when you were Muslim, are you permitted to kiss a stone or revere a stone or worship a stone? No, Some? I'm not supposed to, only that one. So why is that stone at the very center of Islam, the most holy place in all the world? What is that stone doing there? Well, to me, I think it's all about economy and politics. Okay, That's but theologically, my how, can that, how can you resolve that <laughs> theologically? And just to make a story, there's a, uh, Muhammad was there, and that was is, is, uh, uh, the biggest uh, stone that... God, or does Allah, it, I forgot it. it. By you saying that, haven't you committed shirk right there? Supposed to. <laughs> haven't you committed shirk by even trying to answer that question? And are you not a mushrik now? And if yeah. you're a mushrik, then what are you going to do with chapter 9, verse 5 in the Quran, which says, slay the mushrikun wherever ye find them, besiege them, lay in wait with them, or every kind of ambush. Can you see you have fallen, you have now fallen into heresy? That's and yet true. every Muslim wants to kiss that stone. That's true. Every Muslim is participating in shirk. To me, why hasn't anybody mentioned this publicly? We're going to start doing it next week. Actually, we've been on the apologetic, Indonesian apologetic. We've been mentioned that many, many times. But the problem is uh, they lie. They, they believe their lie. That's the problem. And it's like it's Robin, Robin Hood believe Robin Hood believe their lies, right? <laughs> so uh, my eyes were open now. You know, the well, more I learn from you, from um, from other brothers, you know, 
the more my eyes were open. This is ridiculous. Well, that's why we need to make sure that we get this out <laughs> to the public and that we need to make sure people like you need to make sure that others hear about it because the enormous amount of contradiction that Islam is made up of, the enormous amount of lies and the enormous weakness historically that Islam is dependent on. We need to expose those weaknesses. That's right. I, I've so seen brother that. Jody, brother Jody, brother Scott, you need to bring more people like uh, Jay Smith. Well, we have. Over we've here. had Robert Spencer. <laughs> we've had Adam Seeker. We've yeah, had we Osama Dakdok. Please oh. go to our YouTube channel and look for those yeah, videos watch, that we recorded. That. <laughs> and we'll have them back. Uh, some right. of them, whoever yeah. will come back, we'll have back. Right. We'll, we'll because have... this is the thing I see. This is the thing and I see in America. You know, most Americans don't see the dangers of Islam. They see the dangers of the chasing uh, uh, Jehovah Witness and Mormonism or whatever, but they are no threat to American soil. But Islam is the threat on American soil. And we have to come together. We have to expose this. Uh, when you see the Muslims surrounding uh, so peaceful, that because they, they're doing taqiyya, when they're little, they're submissive. But when they get a little bigger, they oppress you. So we have to get this for all Americans, especially for the church. The church has to start opening to this knowledge. You know, don't feel sorry for Islam. You know, feel sorry for yourself. Feel sorry for America. What's happened when America become Indonesia? You know, when you... You just say, when you talk about Muhammad, you're not going to go to jail. But, sir, when you talk against Muhammad in Indonesia, in Pakistan, you go to jail. You know, my head is halal in Indonesia because I spoke against Muhammad and they're still chasing me. <laughs> you're, and she's correct. And that's one of the big problems that we're facing all around the world. There is a fear of saying this in public. And what I'm trying to do, and I think one of the things that we're trying to help people with, this kind of material in C, you can actually say in public. Now, there are some places in Indonesia you have to be very careful. I would not confront Muhammad in Indonesia, but you can confront the Quran in Indonesia. You can confront the Quran. Stay away from Muhammad for the mount, time being. Confront the Quran. Look at all these, the kiddots. That's, that is, I mean, I go up on my YouTube site and the, the, one of the biggest countries that's pulling down my videos is Indonesia. Are you in yeah. Indonesia now? I'm in Florida right now. You're in Florida, but you're from yeah. Indonesia. I'm from Indonesia. I actually, I was uh, a recruiter. I was a jihadist recruiter <laughs> okay. in the past. <laughs> so you, you know where you, you know of what I speak. And that's yes. why that we're trying to get this kind of material out to them. Oh, hold on. We're trying to get this material out as best we can. And so it's, it, it's, it's so neutral, it's so devastating, and it is so, it, uh, it, it is so foundational. The other great thing about this kind of material, Lindsay, Lindsay, um, I, I, Lindsay sorry, is that it is so visual. Yes. You don't have to know Arabic to know this material. You don't have to learn an awful lot of, of Hadith material. All you need to do is look at maps, look at graphs, look at timelines, and just hold up books. You can pretty well get your whole argument. I haven't said anything hardly that was Arabic today. You notice that? Mm -hmm. And all of you people can use what I've said today and just source it by going back and looking and say, go to the videos and watch it. That's the beauty of this kind of material. It is so easy to use. And what we're finding out from a lot of people around the world, this is what they've been waiting for. They're, they're a little reticent to talk about all the problems with Muhammad. And I would say, be reticent. Don't, that's not for the first time you talk. Don't bring that into your conversation. Just ask simple questions like, so you say Muhammad lived in Mecca. Prove it. Yeah. Don't talk about the 9th and 10th century. Prove it from the 7th century. See how easy that is. So you say the Quran existed in 652 with Uthman. Prove it. Do you have a manuscript? Can you show me? Does one exist from the 7th century? See how easy that is. All you need to ask is prove it, prove it, prove it. That puts the onus on their shoulders and say, listen, I'm not asking you to prove it today. Come back next week. We're going to have coffee and we'll let's, let's, uh, let's prick it up in a week. But I want you to tell me, show me one reference to Mecca. 
Show me one reference to Muhammad. Show me one reference to the Quran in the seventh century. That's all I'm asking. Simple as that. That is not at all Islamophobic. It doesn't at all create hatred. And you're doing the same thing that you would have asked of any religion. You would have to ask this of the Bhagavad Gita. You would ask this of the Vedas, the Upanishads, the, the Book of Mormons, uh, Charles T. Russell's writings. You would ask this of anybody. You would ask the simple historical questions. That's all we're asking. And what it does, we're finding Muslim after Muslim leaving Islam because of this. I was just on just about two weeks ago. A girl came to my, my, one of my courses. I'm lead, I, t- I teach uh, at Veritas. I think, uh, uh, Jody, you're going to start taking courses with us. But I teach there, and we have now five professors, and we were in the middle of a talk there. I was doing a talk on Muhammad. And she asked to come in on the class, and we allowed her to come in. And in the Q&A period, she said, man, let me just tell you something. She was in a car because she could not speak from her home because she lives in, in Texas. Uh, she, her mother, or, or she's half Pakistani and half Iranian, Muslim. And she says, I was told to look at one of your videos, Jay. And I didn't want to look at the video because I was in this discussion with this Christian for over. She's studying to be law, a lawyer. She was going to be get, uh, sit for her bar exam. Amazingly bright individual, this Muslim lady, girl uh, in her 20s. And she said, I was asked to look at this one video that you did in London which is the video I did at at Kensington Temple on the very question we're talking about today. But I did it way back in 2019. I didn't have near the material that I have today. And I didn't want to watch it until I finally decided I would sit down and watch it. She said, I watched that. It was an hour and a half long. By the end of 90 minutes, I had left Islam. Mm -hmm. After watching that video, there was not a thing I could do, she said. I could not intellectually go back to Islam after seeing that video. She said, I hadn't become a Christian yet. I hadn't become a Christian, but I still wanted to know God. I still believed in God. I still believe in the prophetic line. I still believe that there was a person named Jesus, and that was the next step. But you destroyed Islam in just 90 minutes. Wow. Now, that was that was two years ago, over two years ago. Oh, thank you. And I couldn't believe that something that, that could be that pivotal that quickly for just one individual of her intellect. But we're getting now reference after reference of people who have left Islam. They're yeah. commenting, they're sending That's it true. on my comments, and they've all left Islam because of this video or that video or another video that David Ed Wood has done or I have done or Sam Shamoon has done or Hatun, Hatun, Hatun Tash has done. Yeah. She, I mean, the, the videos we're coming up with, but the difficulty for a lot of these Muslims, those who are in Indonesia, and as you said, those who are in Pakistan, they cannot go public with what they're finding. They cannot go public with what they're hearing. They cannot go public with their own decisions. That's true. And that's where they need our help. And that's where yeah, I was. I mean, uh, uh, when I left Islam, I have I have to leave Indonesia because back then, in ninety around the nineties, uh, it was kind of hot situation when when uh, Jakarta was on fire. I mean, the whole Indonesia was on fire due to this uh, Islamic uh, submerge. And I have to leave Indonesia. Uh, by the way, Brother Jay, I have a message from WAFM from Brother YP, Chris. Uh, when are you going back to Zoom Indonesia <laughs> to continue uh, your speaking? <laughs> oh, so he needs to contact me. I'm waiting for a contact. If he okay. Can okay, YP, you have to contact Brother Jay. Oh. You know, Chris, right now, Chris is on a mission. Uh, the one that contact you, Brother Chris. He's on a mission, and, and I think um, uh, Ternate uh, on the east part of Indonesia, and he has no access probably. So uh, I'm going to ask Brother White Pete to contact you. Contact me, you give me some dates, and I'll more. Than, I'd love to help him out. All right, sweet. Jay, I've Thank got you. a couple uh, quick questions that should be easy to answer. First, Predicator asks if he can uh, translate your videos. Please translate anything I do. It's public domain. Whatever they want, they need. If he needs the PowerPoints, have him email me. and I'll give you my email. Sure. I'll just put it here. I'll, I'll put yeah. it here in the chat. If people need to email me, I'll put it in the chat. I can give it to Scott or give it to Jody, and Jody can distribute it to us. If you would yeah, mind doing that, Lindsay, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. So yeah, have it's a lot me. easier. You know, it's it's a lot safer for you to contact the person who contact you than you put it into uh, the public's. Uh, right. I'm, I'm just playing safety. Oh, I know here. because I've been harassed and harangued when Muslims got a hold of it. I, I they, right. they spam my box enormously. So right. just uh, either give it to Scott or Jody, yeah. and they will distribute it to us. 
All right. Second quick question. Uh, the J asks, did many, were there many people named Muhammad in the year 620 in Medina? It was a common name because it was the praised one. This is known all over that part of the world. All right. Just like there were many Umars. There, it was a, norm, a, norm, a normal name. Just like there were many Uthmans. The same token, you could say there were many Jesuses in the first century. Yeah. Right. There's many names caught too. Right. Uh, I see that there's lots of massive revivals. So I think the second largest uh, revival percentage wise is in Iraq or Iran behind China. I see that this new information that there are many holes in the narrative. There's many people that's actually realizing and seeing dreams and visions in Muslim countries. And they're actually uh, coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you speak on the new findings we uh, have found out about Islam and the new and all these massive amounts of Muslims coming to Jesus through revival and seeing visions and seeing the facts. Uh, could you speak on that? Yes, I, I would be. You're hearing an awful lot of this, and I would be careful about some of the sources you're getting. There are there's a number of things happening in missiology, uh, Jody, that uh, that we I need to caution you about. There are groups of people called the insider movement. Are you familiar with that term? The insider, no. I thought yes. I heard about that. Yeah. None of you have heard about the insider movement? I've heard of it. I've, yeah. I've heard Scott, of it. Scott, what do you know about sure. the insider movement? Just so we're talking right. on the same page. The idea of the insider movement is that Muslims who, who become Christians would stay inside Islam, continue to go to mosque and dress as Muslims, live among the people. And uh, that's the insider movement, what I know. Yeah, that and in just one sentence, that that's a good definition of it. It's to stay inside. They don't have to leave Islam uh, because Islam ha and, uh, and we sh share the same God. We share the same prophetic line. Muhammad, we have no problem with Muhammad. He is a prophet. He's not a very good prophet, but he is still prophet. There's nothing wrong with the Quran because you can, if you look at the Quran correctly, you can find the gospel in the Quran. Therefore, stay in the mosque, continue to do the five prayers, continue to call yourself a Muslim, and for all practical purposes, just love Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that's all you need to do. So that's the insider movement. And that's where most of these claims are coming from, Jody. So be careful of the claims you're hearing. I'm just warning you, because they're the ones that are claiming millions that have come to Christ in Indonesia and in uh, and Bangladesh. But do you believe that these people have really come to Christ? Not when they're going to the mosque and not when they're still doing the five prayers, no. Why not? Since all they need to know that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Well, they need to know more than that. They need to not serve other gods as well. That's one of the uh, commandments that I'll show They would say they, they serve the same God we serve. Allah and Yahweh yeah. are the same God. Well, you ask the scholars in Islam and the scholars in Christianity, and they would both disagree with that statement that there's not the same God. Actually, the scholars would agree with that. Most scholars do believe that Abra the Abrahamic faiths have the same God. Oh. Abraham was, whether you call it Allah, that's just the Arabic name for God. Or you call it Yahweh. That's just the Hebrew name for God. It's the same God. How do you defend that? Ooh, um, I would just go with the, a lot of the probably get together the sources of Islam and the sources of Christianity that would actually dispute that. I can go much quicker. Let me show you how I do it. When anybody comes up to me and say, we share the same God, I go up to them and I shake their hands. Oh, yes. I heard, I heard this. You said. Okay, let me hear you, you do said, it. You said, well, praise God. Uh, I'm glad you can eat pork now. I'm glad you can worship. Uh, no, 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 no. And drink a bottle of wine. No, or... no, no, no. I don't say that. I, I, I don't know where you got that from. That's not me. Okay. I love pork. I love wine, but I don't say that because that will just destroy. This is what I do. I shake their hands and I say, I'm so glad you have finally admitted that Allah is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad that you have finally admitted that Allah entered time and space, was walking and talking the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. I'm so glad after 1,400 years, you're the first Muslim that has finally admitted that Allah died on the cross and rose again. And I'm so <laughs> glad that you have finally admitted, and we've been asking you for years, that Allah is the Son of God. Thank God, because those are the four things that we have always disputed you on. And you That's now right. have admitted that we share the same God. Well, then you have to agree to say yes to all those four things. Now, what have I just done, Jody? I have actually underlined exactly the primary, the four primary differences between Allah of the Quran and Yahweh of the Bible. Amen.
and I have taken it down to a theological premise, and I've destroyed the foundation. After you say those four things, how long did it take me? 10 seconds, maybe 20 seconds at the most. You can do it in 20 seconds, and you can destroy from that time on that we do not share the same God. Not at all. Unless you can say yes to those four things. That God, Allah, is triune. That Allah entered time and space. That Allah died on the cross, and that Allah has a son. Bingo. That's all I want to hear from Muslims. And the insider movement is not doing any of that. They're allowing them to do what, what most people are doing. We share the same God. We share the same prophetic line. We have the same books. Once you do that, you have pretty much you're emasculated Jesus Christ. Because this is not the Jesus. He is not in this book at all. The gospel cannot be found in the Quran. Muhammad has nothing to do with the prophetic line. And I want nothing to do with Allah. He is dis, uh, dis, uh, he is deceitful, duplicitous, and in every case, he is not the God I see in this Bible. And that's why, please, if you get that wrong, everything else gets wrong, okay? Okay, what, what books would you, besides the one you've already mentioned, are there any other books that people that wants to learn more about this or people that wants to be more effective of witnesses? Are there any books that you would recommend? Nothing has been written about this because this is all only two years old. We're just now going to have to write books on this. This is all brand new. Now, the one book that you can get if you have the two books that I would get right now. This is the one that was probably told to you by Robert. Right. But this is coming out on July 13th. Yeah. I've, right, got I've, got old, I've got the old version of that. Get the uh, new one. It's Brother much, Jay, Brother Jay, I have a book called It's All About Muhammad by F.W. Burlough. What do you think about that book? I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch the name. I have uh, It's All About Muhammad by F.W. Burlough. I've never what heard of it. What do you think? Sorry. Uh, let me show you the book. Hold on a second. But this is going, actually, he rewrote this book last year because of us. He came onto my show a year ago. And I started introducing all this new stuff on the inscription, the coins. Hold on. Let me just look at it again real closely. It's all about Muhammad. Yeah. Never heard of him. Sorry. Never heard of him. Yeah. Let me, uh, give, me the, the, give me the title again. The, the, put it up. Uh, let me see what it says. A biography of the world's most notorious prophet. Illustrated. <laughs> now, is that a critical biography or is that just another, uh, another biography? Uh, it's, a, it's a critical biography, but it's also... Uh, you know, it's it's a proving that why why is he become a prophet and all of those uh, like a miracle since he was a baby or or, or a proof that he he married Khadija. So it's kind of mix. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of that he's just using the tr Islamic traditions. Why does he waste his time on the Islamic traditions? Right. I would suggest you do what Robert Spencer has done. This guy yeah, has he's done away with the Islamic tradition. Say, what do we know from the seventh century? He's basically doing what I just did, but he doesn't have all the newest material because this was written in November, uh, and already it's out of date. And I said that to him. I said, you're gonna you haven't talked about the inscriptions. You haven't gone about the coins. You haven't talked about some of the most devastating material that's coming out of Jerusalem. That's all stuff that's going to be coming out next week. So even as you buy these books, they're already out of date. The one that is probably the tome that almost all of us use is like the, an encyclopedia is this book right here. Um, and let's see. Hopefully we can figure out which one. Okay, that seeing is. Islam. Seeing Islam as others see it. Let me just open up the title page. Maybe that's better. Seeing Islam as others see it by Dr. Robert Hoyland. Okay, I can Sorry, see it. Okay. You can get this in PDF, by the way. You don't have to buy it. You can get it in okay, PDF. Okay, cool. Now, this do you, do you have the PDF uh, that you can share with us? You can email me, and I'll, uh, uh, Jody, if you email me, or, or okay, Scott, or Lindsay, if you email me, I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs> I, don't have, it I don't have the access to you. I have YP. YP, I uh, have the access to you. Whoever, just have some, one okay. person email me. Don't all of you email me. Just one of you email okay. me. I'll send it, right. and you can Bye, Scott. <laughs> Brother Jay, uh, would you do let me, me, tell you, a let me just tell you why this is important? This book is the one that goes to everything that was written in the seventh century, and he basically takes it. He reads and writes eighteen languages. He takes all of it wow. and then he puts it into English so we can read it. That's why this is such a devastating. Awesome. Well, I want to know when you're going to write your book so I can buy it. It's coming out. I'm in the process of writing it now, and. 
you know, one of the things I do, Jody, if you just look at every one of my Fander films, I'm putting up about a film right now about every other day, a new film. And it's all brand new material. And we're getting almost all of them are going over 10,000 views. Many of them, like the one yesterday, was already over 21,000 views. We're getting so many. But at the bottom of every of those films is a description box. In the description box, I do a summary of everything I've had in that video. There is the summary. Now, I'm pulling all those summaries together and writing a book out of it, because the thing you can't do in the description box, you can't put footnotes, you can't put bibliographical uh, material, you can't put quotations. And so that's all going to be coming in the book. So that's being awesome. put together as we speak. All right. Our brother, awesome. Adam Seeker, has a question or comment. This is going to be have, the, have to be the last one. It's time to wrap things up. So, Adam, uh, what do you have to say? Yes, one of the major problems that Jay raised um, the insider movement that's happening a lot in Pakistan. Mm. It's so devastating that in Pakistan, uh, now it's like a kind of a Christian cult slash sect, whatever you may like to call it, which believes that even though Jesus is Lord, yet Muhammad is a prophet. And that's the movement that we have to destroy. And I fully agree with Jay on that. And we, we have to do more on this one uh, for, for sure. Adam, thanks for that. And I would just say, one of the questions I always ask insiders, you can call him Lord and Savior, but then Muslims would say Jesus is Lord too. If Lord means he is an authority and a prophetic line. Savior, well, that's the function of every prophet. What I want to hear you say is, is Jesus Allah? Exactly. None of the insiders are willing to say that. And they are not willing to say that Jesus is part of the Trinity. They will not be Trinitarian. So how can you say that they understand Jesus as Lord and Savior and who then died on the cross? And what was the purpose if he wasn't God? Bingo. I mean, that goes right to the heart of everything we believe. If we do not believe that was God that was dying on the cross, then how can we say we're still damned? How can we say that we're, we're saved? So even the salvation that they're talking about is not the salvation I know in the Bible. Absolutely. That will be another homework for Adams. Oh, yes. I'm, right, I'm going to do some videos on this kind of a twist. Uh, thank you awesome. for for awesome uh, video. By the way, I have requested you to come on my channel as well, if you, if possibly you could. Email uh, me, that I'll come on great. your channel. I'd love to. Thank you. You're, are you in Pakistan? No, I'm out of Pakistan right now. Okay, well then... That's Otherwise, that's... I would have been killed he's, anyways. He's right nearby me. Pakistan, <laughs> we would have to be careful what I say. He, but he's, no, Pakistan, don't worry. Don't worry, Jay. He's nearby me. Okay. Well, if you're here, then, oh, that's too bad. I was in Florida just uh, <laughs> in January. I, in fact, I'll be there again in this next January. So we'll have to meet okay, up. Okay, stop by, see me. Well, where are you in Florida? I mean, what St. Lucy? Tradition. Okay, I'll, I'll be in Orlando, so. Okay, it's two hours away. Okay, well, we'll, we'll get together and have some coffee. Maybe sure, sure. I have a good coffee, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Jay, for coming out and teaching us and uh, uh, giving your time and everyone who participated in the chat and was respectful for all your questions and, and your uh, participation. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, us. We are the disciples of Yahweh in Christ. Uh, I'm Scott and my brother is Jody. Here's our email address. You can point your phone at the screen to get that. We also have this uh, video will be on YouTube on our channel. Uh, look below in the description box for all the resources that were mentioned in the video. And we have other videos like Robert Spencer was on our uh, show last week uh, or a couple of weeks back. We have a, a Facebook page. We just started. Come on out to our Facebook page and uh, you can continue these interactions. We can um, um, we also post upcoming events. And uh, just before we give Jay the last word, I want to check in with Brother Jody. Yeah, just uh, please subscribe to our channel. Please uh, like our uh, videos and please share our videos. And so we can get uh, even better and better speakers. Can't get much better than Jay. I think he's the uh, top gun. So uh, we really do appreciate him joining us, uh, sacrificing his valuable time. And please uh, keep uh, Jay's uh, ministry in your prayers. He's on the front lines. He's, he's actually a target of the Islamic extremists. Uh, pray for his safety and protection. And uh, let's uh, turn it over to Jay for the last word. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think this is, this is the, these are the kind of shows that I think need to get out there. People need to 
you need to bring as many of, uh, of people who are like me. You need to bring Al-Fadi in, bring David Wood if you can get him, Sam Shamoon, get Hatun Tasha. She'd love to talk oh, to you. <clears throat> I, I've, I, I've actually wanted to get her. I don't have no contact. Maybe I can email you. Email me and that. I'll give you the contact because you need to start, you need to make sure you're getting all the major players. And these are the major players. I'm glad you got Robert Spencer. Uh, he is one of the the best ones for getting it down and writing it on paper. Right. But uh, I think what Jody, you can contact YP for all of the contacts. You can okay, I, email you. me yeah. and, and you can get those. Now, but I think in conclusion, what you've seen and what we're finding out, I'm, I, I've been working in this kind of world, the historical critique. We call it the historical critique since 1995. So 26 years I've been working on this, but I've never seen the material that we're getting now. When the, the Patricia Crones and the uh, Michael Cooks and the John Wansboroughs, these are all the scholars who have done, who've gone ahead of us. When they were working on this kind of material, they only had one or two people to help them out. They didn't have the internet. Today, I have about 20 to 30 people. In fact, that phone you kept on hearing that, that was interrupting it was one of my researchers. I have so many researchers helping me out and we have immediate in, uh, access because of the internet. We are getting so much new material. It's almost hard to keep up with it. I could almost put up a video a day, but I've got so many other responsibilities. I can't do that. But everything we're putting up is brand new. We have, we're not um, everything we're putting up, if you can see, almost every, no, I say not every, almost everything we're putting up, no one has put up before. That shows that there's an enormous amount of new research yet to uncover. And as I say, the more we scratch, the more we find. The more we find, the more we shine. The more we shine, the more they whine. Oh, how sublime. That, the fact that we're uh, able to un unpack so much and so many artifacts, murals, ta tablets, stellas, artifacts such as buildings, rock inscriptions, coins, and then, of course, the manuscripts. The more that we look at them, the more that we're coming up with not only the evidence that Islam did not exist at the time of Prophet Muhammad, was not introduced by a man named Muhammad, had nothing to do with Muhammad of the, of the 9th and 10th century. What we now know is that this was a Christian sect that start ameliorating and started to be formed as to give the Arabs their identity. And the Arabs wanted their distinct identity from the line of Ishmael because they didn't have a scripture like the Jews and the Christians had. They didn't have a prophetic line like the Jews and the Christians had. So how are you going to get your own prophetic line? How are you going to get your own revelation? You're going to have to create that prophetic line and you're going to have to create that book. Once they got the book and the man, they need the place. Once they had the place, Islam then formed. That we're now seeing that happened not over a 22 year period, like Muslims like to tell us, that happened over two to 300 years. Isn't that how all religions that are man made start? That's all we have to say today. It looks like we have an awful lot yet to unpack. The next time I come on, I'll have even more new material to introduce to you. God bless you. It's been God pretty good. Thank you.